1609, the British East India Company opens up trade with India, offering at first wealth in exchange for goods. Later it becomes ruled by force. When the Indians fight back, the British call it mutiny. The Indians, on the other hand, call it a war for independence. In 1858, the British government takes power from the East India Company and viceroys rule in the name of the distant crown. Amid fantastic pomp and splendor, King George and Queen Mary come to India in 1911 to accept the allegiance of their hundreds of millions of subjects. Great Britain's might and majesty seem secure. But one day, the shy son of an obscure Indian official will humble the empire. His name, Mohan. The battle for independence cannot be stopped as Mohandas Gandhi walks off to jail. Thousands of Gandhi's disciples are also in prison. Non-violence, he tells them, requires more bravery than violence. Pandit Nehru and his daughter Indira become leaders in India's freedom movement. The fabled land of the Taj Mahal, 87% of its men and 98% of its women are illiterate. Independence is coming, and Gandhi, leader of 300 million Hindus, meets with Mohammed Jinnah, leader of 100 million Muslims, in hopes of creating a unified new nation. However, Jinnah is adamant that the Muslim minority in the British colony must have a country of its own. And so, predominantly Hindu provinces become India, and Muslim provinces, Pakistan. August 15, 1947, Independence Day. In New Delhi, the birth of a nation as an era of colonialism ends. Pandit Nehru, India's first prime minister, leads the flag-raising ceremonies. Gandhi is absent. Why this celebration, he asks. I see only rivers of blood. Pakistan is divided into two parts, west and east. Mohammed Jinnah has succeeded in establishing a Muslim nation, but at a tragic cost. When the British depart, Hindus and Muslims, bitter in their hatred of one another, are free at last free to turn their hatred into violence.
The unholy war takes half a million lives. When the United Nations Security Council meets in 1948, India and Pakistan accuse each other of aggression in the disputed province of Kashmir. A ceasefire is voted, but sporadic fighting goes on. In foreign affairs, Nehru follows a neutralist policy of non-alignment. Traveling on both sides of the Iron Curtain, the Indian leader is equally at home before communist and free world parliaments. When President Eisenhower visits New Delhi in 1959, he receives an unforgettable welcome. Riding into the city at dusk, the president's car is swallowed up by more than two million people, chanting, long live the United States of America. Cheers also ring out for Premier Zhou Enlai of China when he comes to strengthen diplomatic ties with India. Almost half of the world's population lives in the two countries. Friendly at first, border clashes soon strain Sino-Indian relations. 1965, the smoldering dispute over Kashmir erupts again. In 16 years, 20,000 people have died in skirmishes along the UN ceasefire line. Now the frontier again echoes and shudders to the sounds of a full-scale undeclared war. Across the border from India into Pakistan and Pakistan into India stream fighting men of both nations. Smoke blankets the mountainside, and ancient villages are reduced to rubble. Again, refugees clog the dirt roads of the troubled land, fleeing with whatever earthly possessions they can carry. Confronted with a grave new threat to world peace, the United Nations Security Council meets an emergency session. It is the 125th meeting on the Kashmir question. The council, by unanimous vote, directs Secretary General Uthant to seek an immediate ceasefire. The fighting ends, but tensions remain high. In 1966, Pakistani President Khan, Russian Premier Kosygin, and Prime Minister Shastri of India meet at Tashkent in a Soviet-sponsored conference designed to work out a permanent solution to the Kashmir dispute. An agreement is reached under which Indian and Pakistani armies are withdrawn on both sides of the Kashmir border. Also, diplomatic relations and commercial airline flights are resumed between the two countries. Diplomacy in Asia takes a new turn. Nineteen seventy-one, an East Pakistani independence movement triggers a new crisis on the subcontinent. Refugees... Relief centers are set up to care for the 10 million men, women, and children who flee East Pakistan in the first seven months of the year. Disease, hunger, misery stalk every camp as tension mounts again. As the crisis deepens, Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko comes to New Delhi to confer with Mrs. Indira Gandhi, Pandit Nehru's daughter, and now the Prime Minister of India. Later, the two countries sign a 20-year treaty of peace and cooperation. The pact calls for consultations if one or the other is attacked. While no mention is made of military support, the historic pact marks a significant new milestone in relations between India and Russia. 
Rawalpindi, capital of Pakistan, by the Soviet Union's Yakub Malik, accuses the Chinese delegate of using the UN as a forum for slander and anti-Sovietism. The Pakistani representative, Aga Shahi, pleads for United Nations action to brand India as an aggressor. India's Samar Sen describes General Assembly intervention as unrealistic and dangerous. Afghanistan abstention. The voting reflects an overwhelming sentiment for an immediate ceasefire. Yes. Yes, Barbados. Yes. Uganda. Yes. Yes, Ukrainian SSR. No. No, USSR. No. Among the handful of nations voting no are Bulgaria, Cuba, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and Poland. The result of the voting is as follows in paper 104, opposed 11, abstention 10. The draft resolution is adopted. India ignores the General Assembly action as her forces drive deeper and deeper into East Pakistan. Finally, Pakistani forces lay down their arms. The war is ended as a new nation, Bangladesh, is proclaimed in East Pakistan. Seventy million people, living on an average income of a dollar a week, must somehow survive and somehow build a future in one of the most populous 